The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere in dialogue about what matters most, the knife's edge of this very moment. And we've got some mental models to discuss at the knife's edge. Um, so today, if you haven't been here before, this is part of a Sense Maker in Residence series. Um, this happens over a course of a month, uh, four sessions, same time, uh, same day. Um, where uh, a person comes uh, who's making sense of the world, uh, helps us make sense of the world, and we can make sense of it together. Um, and Peter Wang is here, uh, entrepreneur, uh, student of the human condition, uh, is going to talk about the mental models he uses to navigate the complexities of our world. And last session was really fun. He had a PowerPoint, listed all his models, and today he has a, a set of mental models that um, he's going to uh, talk about. So how today is going to work. If you have any questions, uh, anytime Peter is talking, follow them in the chat, uh, have like a cue or question before your actual question. This will go on YouTube. So if you want me to read it on your behalf and you don't want to be on YouTube, just let me know. Uh, and then uh, when we're at a point where we're going to field questions, I'll take it in. You'll unmute yourself, ask your question to Peter. Uh, we'll be here for an hour. Um, we'll kind of feel it if we can be here a little bit uh, over the hour, but I think that's that. That being said, I will take Peter in, give him host access so he can share his screen. So good morning, my friend. Good morning. Thank you for having me back. Uh, hold on. Let me change my IKEA background here to uh, something a little more reasonable, something I, nice I, for the morning. Feels comfortable looking at the nice IKEA furniture you got going. <laughs> it is, in fact, exactly designed to make you feel comfortable. And that is relevant let me make you feel uncomfortable Ooh. got a fighter jet in your face no that's not good um let's do this uh, just something nice in miyazaki so yes. um okay <clears throat> let me go ahead and share i also i do have a powerpoint again today just to kind of walk through some stuff i don't i don't know if that's uh, is that typical or um i don't know i'm uh it's 50 50 uh i quite enjoy the powerpoint okay good so See so here, share screen, and there it is. Um, okay, so <clears throat> let me go ahead and to, actually, maybe I'll just do it this way. We can sort of, well, no, I'll just go into presenter mode. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for, for joining today and uh, sharing, sharing your time and, and part of your day with me. Um, the the today I decided what I would talk about um, is the idea. Well, I've lost my mouse now, so somehow Zoom has decided that I don't have a mouse. Okay, there it is. It's good enough. Okay, so today I want to talk about relationships and um, the sense of self, and that touches on identity. It touches on a bunch of different interesting things. Um, it's kind of a shift from what we talked about last time. Last time was much more, you know, metaphysical and kind of a very cerebral exercise about how we how we look at what is a thing and what is reality. This is also talking about reality, but it's talking much more than about the subjective aspects of reality. Um, let me zoom in just a little bit. All right. So, um, so let's get right into it. So, um, I think typically when we think about relationships. Um, we think about them as, okay, this connective thing between selves or between individuals or between an object and another object. We can talk about the relationship that um, we have with each other. We can talk about the relationships between people, the relationship between a car and the road or a spacecraft and the gravitational field around it. You know, we, we talk about relationships as between two things, between two objects. Um, and you can draw it very simply like this as sort of a, what we call a node link diagram. So you have nodes and the relationships are the links between them. But when we construct it in this way, the emphasis in, is entirely, it's almost, it's almost hard to see it until you look at it. Um, but there is this extreme prejudice towards the self, the atomic selves and objects as being primary. They're the primary things, they're the nodes. I mean, even in the, we don't call it a link of nodes, we call it node link diagram, right? Even our emphasis in the word order really shows you the, 
the perspective we have on this, which is that there are these nodes and we can, if we're talking about physics or we're talking about psychology, we can talk about the selves or the nodes as atomic things unto themselves. Um, and, and then we can talk about the relationship to other things. The relationship is secondary, right? And so I would like, when I talk about inverting this view, um, what I mean is, what if we view the relationships as the first class thing? What if it's actually, it's not atoms, and then there's some interaction between atoms, but the interaction, the field, is the primary thing? Okay, now, does that make sense? Like, do you, do, like it's a different kind of view. I think I'm, I'm obviously just having seen some Peter's writing. Um, I know Peter understands this um, concept, right? This idea that if we actually flip this around and we don't view the atomized individuals, we don't view the, the car as an object on the road. We don't just view a planet in the space of the gravitational field. We flip around and we talk about the gravitational field as the primary thing that through its action pushes and smushes a bunch of things together to form planets. All of a sudden, I mean, it's the same physics, it's the same stuff, and yet it completely flips the world on its head. If you view yourself not as an agent and a self that has relationships, but rather you are the emergent result of all of the relationships around you, it's kind of like, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of interesting, right? And a relationship is just a tube, right? In this way, it's a tube with inputs and outputs at either end, right? It's a binding between two different things, or if you have a whole lot of them, it's a field. It's like the ocean. It's a thing that, it's a binding energy that creates atomized locations. And so if you then um, take this, you can sort of see the self as the region as defined by relationships. So if you are a baby and imagine, uh, I don't know how many people here have, have children. I know there's some, um, there's a, there's a wide variety of uh, age groups represented here uh, at the STOA. But as I was raising my child, I began to realize, well, I have two children, a 10-year-old and a six-year-old now, but I began to realize how much my language and my interaction with them was explicitly creating a relationship with them that defined selfhood for them. Um, and in fact, if you look at um, childhood, like early childhood psychology, and you look at some of these kinds of things, you can define that like the Piaget uh, scale of, of, um, of infant development, there's, there's, a, there's an early stage where they're, they're just a blob of like neurons and meat, right? And then eventually the neurons get a sense of like, oh, there's persistence of, there's a constant concept of object persistence. Like, oh, when a thing moves behind another thing, it's still the same thing. So their brain and their visual cortex, uh, cortices are sort of still wiring up this basic level at a perceptual level. And over time, they develop a theory of action. I can move my hands. I can suck on my thumb. I can cry and I get milk, right? There's all these things. But as they become, um, as they really develop a sense of, of coherent self, the parents around them are the ones that then define the social self and begin to give them a sense of, I am your caregiver, I, or I am your punisher, or I define what you can do. And, and there's like this... So even from a very early age as humans, we're molded by our interactions with the, the caregivers around us. And as we go into late childhood and into teenage year time frame, that's when we start to develop an inner or innate self. You can think of this as the id, right? And then projecting the ego. And that's back pressure against the social cells coming in. And of course, this comes to a head in our teenage years as we, as we exceed and break and push back on some of these relationships, some of which have been fundamental to us since we were, you know, blobs of neurons and meat, right? And so this idea that, that selfhood is not an atomic, like it ends at my skin, okay? My self certainly, of course, is not end of my skin. It's vocally projected into a microphone, which then goes out into the internet to all of you all. So my self is actually quite extended in the age of the internet. But even if I were to think of myself as just this physical body defined by skin, that's, that's a very, very... Uh, impoverished view because I'm a social human being in the modern world. My self, my identity, my avatar is actually uh, the the endpoints of a lot of these relation, a lot of these um, these relationships. And even here, uh, before Peter invited me here onto the Stoa, I did not exist inside this social realm. Now I do exist in the social realm as a person, as a sense maker, but as a person who's been given the privilege of the platform to speak to all of you, right? And so all of so many aspects, and I've gained that now part of my identity. So all of these different aspects of selfhood are actually defined by the relationships that we allow to come in or that we invest into. It's an input output. 
right? If I do a terrible job at this right now, <laughs> if I completely just waste everyone's time and I'm quite boring um, and I add no value whatsoever, you know, I probably won't be invited back, right? <laughs> and so there's, there's an input and output, there's expectations and there's stress. Stress is just the shifting of that boundary of self with it, not, not just, but in the sense of social stress, we can talk about that as the, 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 the energy it takes to kind of shift um, the, the, the boundaries of self within all of these, the social environment we live in. So that's, that's sort of the, 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 the way I wanted to kick this off was to invert the view of relationships from being just a connective thing that atoms do to actually being the field that actually makes atoms possible, that defines what the shape of the atom is. So, and this is um, full disclosure, I, I have a little like nerd out part of me that likes to look at chemistry and atomic physics and to think about atoms themselves in this way, that actually the Cartesian, Newtonian to Bohr and Rutherfordian model of what we think of as an atom is, um, <clears throat> it's quite literal. It's like, oh, here's the planet, you know, the center of the, the nucleus of the atom, electrons orbiting it, except we know that it's not really electrons orbiting, it's a, a quantum, you know, electric, you know, quantum probability wave function that defines what we're likely to find electrons. But if you start going to that more and more, you realize, wait, it's just a giant entangled quantum probability field. And is there even an electron unless we make a measurement on it? If we make a measurement of a certain form, our measuring device gets entangled into the field. And so what the is an atom, is an electron, is any of this stuff? So it's really interesting, this blend between field to corpuscular or atomic theories, even in physics, hard, hard physics. And I'm, I, I, uh, I'm not a practicing physicist anymore, but I did train as a physicist in college. So what I'm telling you, for those who don't know physics, there's nothing, I'm not getting all mumbo jumbo, like quantum mysticism on you. That's literally actually the way that quantum physicists think about this. They know that we don't actually have a hard model of like, here's exactly where the object is. Here's exactly where the electron is. We talk about it as a mathematical wave function. That is the most proper way to talk about it. That's how we make lasers and everything else is because we think in those terms. So even in physics, where we, the, where we most successfully use the word atom and atomization, when it gets down to it, the mechanics of interaction, we have to use wave theories. And so here, I'm suggesting that when we think about the relational dynamics between people in a social environment and between humans, which are not just you know, a proton or a neutron or whatever, that we can use a similar concept. Rather than seeing ourselves as atomic individuals, see ourselves as zones of identity, uh, zones of identity that um, have pressure, back pressure, against all of these different social relationships coming into us. And one thing I'll say about this that's very interesting is if you view this in the context, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about this later in the Q&A. Remind me to talk about celebrity and fame culture, okay, if I forget. But this directly touches on that idea of brands and celebrity and fame culture. So anyway, um, so that's, that's a different way of looking at relationships. But if we ask, okay, how are relationships formed? If they're primal, where do they come from? And and this touches on then intersubjective reality. It touches on, because a relationship, you know, we can say we want it to be primal, but it does seem to have like things, there need to be things relating to each other to form a relationship, don't, don't, doesn't there? So, um, so there's a great uh, document uh, written by a guy named Joe Edelman uh, back in 2017 about conviviality and human relationships. And um, just, I mean, really, really fantastic. Um, and uh, it's actually a Google Doc. I don't know if you'll be able to find it if you search for it, but I did link it here in this and I will upload. I know I promised to upload the previous presentation, I haven't yet. I will upload these presentations so you guys can view the links. But, um, but Joe did this really wonderful analysis and he did a lot of study on this stuff. And he looked at like this question of where does our sense of togetherness? He was talking about this not as just a dyadic relationship between two individuals, but just in general, the social environment. Uh, where does our sense of togetherness come from? And uh, I thought this was a nice little chart to look at uh, demographic affinity, or we could look at you know, different kinds of um, labor relationships. And then um, what he called simultaneous feeling down there. And he, and he evolved from this to, um, uh, not evolves, but he, in that same document, he has this, which then kind of narrows into kind of that, that dyadic mode between two individuals, uh, or you have two, two agents that do not have a relationship, how does a relationship form? Um, and, and he is ultimately identified relationships requiring shared values to exist. And, and I talk about his trust 
right? So what is the origins of trust in human relationships? These are really the building blocks, shared values and, and building trust. And he talked about four different ways that we discover values. And I have, uh, this is one of my mental models that I love the most. Um, he, he has a, if you look for Joe Edelman, uh, Four Social Worlds, he's got this brilliant write-up about that as well that, that talks about, at the end of the day, what, how do we actually start to relate to people? And he identifies these four modes. We can have mutual appreciation. So together, we both go and look at a piece of art. Or together, we both watch a TV show. Or we mutually, we go, both go and pet the same dog. You know, it could be something there builds relationship because there's mutual appreciation. Now, we can also just talk to each other. Just talking is, but talking does not mean using language as weapons. Talking is actually talking. Um, so so you, you can, that's another way to kind of build more trust. Um, conflicts is another way to build trust. So uh, I, I tend to call it trustful conflict when I'm talking about this at a corporate management level. But some people like to think that, oh, we want a safe space and we have everyone trusts each other. It means no one's getting hurt. And it's like, no, 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 no. That just means everyone's pretending to trust each other. Actual trustful relationships are ones in which you can disagree and you know the other person won't come at you in a different angle. So going back to that, to the, to the previous slide here, um, trust means that people know how to stay in their lane and they're not, they're going to stop at the boundary where you want them to stop before it comes into damaging your inner, your inner self. They respect your boundaries that you're setting. Um, that's what trust means in that sense. But conflict simply means we're working through a problem together. And if we go and solve a problem together, in a sense, that's also kind of a flavor of mutual appreciation, right? These all kind of build on each other. Um, but trustful conflict um, is such a hugely important part of building uh, shared values uh, and emerging a relationship because you're both, it's sort of instead of two people looking inwards at each other, they're facing outwards, right? They're facing outwards towards a, a shared problem and have a shared mission, shared values. And lastly, exploring together. And this is very important too, because when we explore, truly explore, we're, we're in a liminal, we're operating in a liminal zone. We don't know. We're not there to confirm a hypothesis we have to prove ourselves right to all the people around us. We are exploring because we literally don't know. Let's just go and talk about it. And it's in a sense, it's also, so the left two you can think of as um, somewhat inward facing towards each other in the dyad. And the last two are sort of outward facing. You're either facing something that threatens you. So you're, you're resolving a conflict. Maybe it's an internal conflict. Maybe it's external conflict. Exploring is definitely outwards facing, right? You're, you're looking at some new space together. So these are ways that we build values. That's how, that's how essentially, if you think about this back to the wave and field analogy, when two things, if you, have, if you throw a rock, if you, or, or maybe the best way to think about it is like if you, have, um, if you have the surface of a pond and you throw a rock into here and you throw a rock over there, those waves will just randomly like, you know, pass through each other. But if you throw rocks of roughly the similar size in at the same speed, those waves will form a resonance pattern and they will form fixed points of, 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 um, of, of uh, constructive and destructive interference. And those wave patterns will be in resonance. So this is really about creating resonant values in that, in that field, in that relationship field. Now that's just dyads. Again, we think about relationship as me to you. Um, but if you think about just four, if you have just four people or four agents or four nodes, how many relationships are there? If you think only in terms of dyadic, you've got seven pairwise relationships, binary or dyadic relationships. But if you think about a relationship as being one person towards a dyad, then there's 12 of those actually. And if you look at it as one person to uh, a, a three-way group, there's four of those. I mean, I'm not gonna read this chart, but, but the, when you get to the two, two and the four zero is very interesting. The idea that relationships themselves have relationships. And this is all very abstract and mathematical, but to make this extremely concrete for people, think about a family with a mother, father, and a son and a daughter. This is my family, right? So, so me and my wife and my son and daughter, we can identify all of these different relationships within that. The relationship, we, we can talk about this intuitively. What is the relationship? Any of us can look at a family and say, what's the relationship here between the parents and the kids? That's now a pair to a pair. That is a two-two relationship, right? What is, so... So you say, well, this family, wow, it's, it's got real issues because the father is like an alcoholic or he's an addict of some sort. Um, and so the, the, this, this has a, there's a broken father figure in this relationship. That's a one, well, 
you can see that's a one, two, right? That father is a bad father figure to the, to the kids, but that father is also a bad husband to the wife. That's a one, one, right? And that father is also a bad father in the family. That's a one, three. So even in a simple, like, you know, your kind of core 1950s uh, sitcom level family unit, you've got, you just add these up. How many different relationships? Let's see here. That's 10, 22, 26, 27 relationships among four people. And this is what you get to when you stop thinking in terms of just nodes. Because if you think just in terms of nodes, you would say, well, there's seven binary, there's seven relationships because you count the lines. There's seven, uh, seven of them, right? Or I guess in here, there's six. What did I get to seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe I miscounted. This is quite embarrassing because this is going to go on YouTube. <laughs> one, three. I could have sworn I counted somehow. Maybe I'm missing one somewhere. Maybe it's only six. Whatever. The point is there's very few. But when you start looking at assemblages, when you look at relationships themselves as being things you can have a relationship with, it becomes much, much larger. And with this last one may seem like a nullity, right? To say, well, if we talk about a four-way, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, it's not a tertiary, quaternary thing, what do they relate to? There's, no, there's nothing for them to relate to. Well, they might relate to other external things. It's like our family. We're, and if you read any Jane Austen, it's like, how does our family sit in the social context, you know, relative to Netherfield and all these things, right? There's a very good sense that, yeah, that multi-way relationship, that's a thing. That's actually a unit. That four-way relationship, um, that has a reality to it. And when you talk about, the, you know, there's a, there's a, in law, you can sue, uh, I think there's, a, you can basically file a civil lawsuit if someone um, it's a concept of loss of consortium. So if you have a couple and then a third party interferes, like, you know, by seducing one of the couple, then the other can sue that person for loss of consortium as in having destroyed the relationship. Right. And we, even in, in popular culture, in the vernacular, we talk about, you know, some like woman that goes to only date married men as a home wrecker right? Not a husband predator, but as a home wrecker. So even in these kinds of terms, we recognize that the multi-way relationship, that concept of home is just sort of, you know, any, any number of people living within that family unit, that family relationship. So again, this is a very long exposition on a single slide where I might've made a math mistake, but the point is that this is, this is a very fundamentally different way to look at the world. Stop viewing people as atoms. Start viewing them as just a collection of relationship endpoints and ask about the relationships they're in. And, and also don't view relationships as just being this pipe, even though I showed a, a tube earlier. They are actually fields. They are kind of collections of waves resonating with each other. They're, they're networks and webs and they have a reality to them. When, in the open source world, right? Something very close to my, to my work and near and dear to my heart. When we talk about a project forking, what's changing there is not someone made a copy of the source code and changed five lines. It's actually that the relationship of the developers and the developer community is sundering. And the people in it are saying, we're okay with sundering with you. We're, we're splitting like mitosis. We're going to split now. And there's something, there's a feeling of loss. Well, what is that feeling of loss? What has been lost? It's all the same people. You got twice as much code. What's been lost? What's been lost is that the relationship of N, that, that sort of, you know, whatever you want to call this order N size relationship web and complex has now been reduced to two times N over two complexes, which are not the same, right? This is Metcalf's law in a nutshell. Uh, Metcalf is the um, guy who invented ethernet, which is kind of how whenever you plug in a jack, you know, into the wall for your computer, uh, the, the protocol that speaks nowadays is all ethernet. He invented that and he had a law, a network, uh, a law about networks. Uh, it's called Metcalf's law, which is that the value of a network grows as N squared right? Where N is the number of nodes in the network. Um, this is why Facebook has astronomical valuations, why all the social media companies, their investors are encouraging them to build viral loops into their thing to get more and more people because the value goes N squared. This is also why extractive capitalism loves this dynamic because extractive capitalism looks for uh, exponentials and a quadratic, uh, well, I mean, sorry, N squared, um, a quadratic approximates an exponential in small parts. <laughs> if you kind of look pretty close to the depending on the, the coefficient. So in any case, this thing is something that I encourage. This is a mental model that I use all the time. When people talk about this, that, their, their relationship is broken, whatever, I stop looking at them as people. I look at what was 
tell me about the relationship. What was important about the relationship itself? What are the relationship, what power did it have unto itself beyond what just the, these individuals can do? Every firm, every institution, everything that we live in nowadays, the 95% of the world that is construct beyond the physical, all of those things are just swimming in this stuff. It's all relationships, your relationship to the institution, the relation within an institution, the relationships of organizations to each other. It's all actually much better understood, not as individuals, not as people, but as relationships and how those individuals might be able to impact those relationships. But the relationships are sort of like the, the, the big bag of the bagpipe that's got all the air in it. You know, the individual might blow into a little bit, but that bag of air, that's the relationship that's gonna power all of the sound. So this is one of my mental models. Now, Related to this, I'll take a, a small pause to have some coffee because I'm talking slower and slower now. Um, related to this concept is Dunbar's number. And Dunbar, um, is, uh, this is a, actually a fairly recent concept uh, as far as you know, academic sort of models and whatnot. It only emerged in the 90s. Um, and it's everyone who mentions Dunbar, it's one of those things where everyone who mentions it mentions it with a critical eye, like, well, if you believe it, or we know it's an approximation, or it's a convenient, uh, it's one of those things that went, what do they talk about? Um, gosh, Johnny Nelson talked about this hilariously. It's like one of those things that went from academia to the talk circuit to the cocktail, cocktail circuit, right? So it's a thing that people, you know, talk about now without, um, without, really diving, diving deep to like, well, what's the basis of it? Is it real? But the idea is very simple. It's just that based on the neocortex size of humans and based on what we've seen in uh, anthropological studies, um, it looks like the natural size for uh, human kind of primeval sort of uh, natural cohesion, social cohesion is around 150, somewhere between 100 to 250, but about 150. And it's really the idea is that you can keep social contact and send social intimacy with about that many people. Beyond that, you kind of lose track, right? And we have this kind of, um, this kind of limit is not new. So like in uh, Plato, right, right, like sort of said, maybe 3,000 people was as big as you could get for some kind of an integrated republic. Um, beyond which then you sort of just see all of it as the other. You don't see it as us. The limit of us is somewhere, depending on what you're trying to do, between 150 to 3,000, I guess, right? And if you are entrepreneurs or you've done startups or businesses, you know there are distinct phases or distinct um, limits beyond which the socialization structure of the group, the crew, the clique has to change in order to scale the mission. So, you know, between three to five people, you got a thing, you get to about 10 to 15 people, then you have to be a little more explicit about how you coordinate. When you get to about 30 to 40, there's another little minor break point, but 60 is a really like make or break thing. When you get to 60, on the other side of 60 people, 60 to 70 people, depending again on the people and what you're doing, you need to then um, build explicit meeting structures. Who knows what? You need to actually model the communications within as an explicit first class thing. Um, and that's exactly a manifestation of this principle that you can no longer hold in your head how other people are relating to each other, what they know, who told who what, how people feel about it. It just gets too much. You have to create a mailing list and say, well, I informed the mailing list and so now I've done the thing I need to do. And then how people relate to that mailing list, that channel, that's on them, right? You create institutions, you create processes so that people then are not relating to each other. They're relating to a pattern of interaction. And now that's what an institution is. Now, the nice thing, the interesting thing about this is that Dunbar's number is about human socialization based on neocortical sort of stuff and anthropological studies of like, you know, people on the banks of some river and straw thatched huts, right? Uh, John, John Nelson just recently published this great work um, where he revisits this in the context of the, um, uh, the, the cybernetic era or the, 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 you know, very online era. And, um, and he says that, you know, Dunbar's number is not so much about the number of people uh, and how many people you have. It's not linear in that. It's about interrelationship comprehension. How does, how do you, how does each person, or how does each relationship interact with all the other relationships? Um, and he says it's quadratic in the upper bounds on the relationships, not linear in terms of nodes. Uh, it's sort of mathematical, but 
but it's it, he's saying it's Dunbar's number is more about the capacity of the if you go back to that the pond and the waves in the pond it's not about how many pebbles can you drop into a pond it's about how much turbulence can you have on a pond surface before it becomes incomprehensible to the people to a node within it to a, a frog you know on a lily on a lily frond like trying to you know a lily pad sorry trying to um make sense of all the waves coming in and maybe that's actually not bad because a, a lily pad actually does have an integration surface area over over the the surface of the pond i like that so if you're frogs on a lily pad you know all these waves are coming in if there's a couple of pebbles dropping in and maybe dunbar in the neolithic era when the water was a certain density 150 pebbles coming in was about how much your lily pad could integrate and the, the, and the frog could still make sense of what's going on in the social media era we need to look at not just how many, because there's a lot of different rocks, but it's the rate at which the rocks are breaking that surface of the water before the frog decides to bail and just give up <laughs> and bounce off that lily pad because it's too chaotic and crazy. So, so to make this concrete, he says, okay, look, in the classical, in classical Dunbar, um, <clears throat> the idea is that the reason why you have a limit is because over time, your model of other people and their relationships to each other, right? Because again, Remember, intersubjective belief is your belief about other people's beliefs, right? Subjectivity is your belief. Intersubjectivity is your belief about others' beliefs. So this ties directly to this idea of you relating to a relationship. What do I believe about how my mom feels about my brother, right? What do I believe about how my sister feels about her boyfriend, right? Your ability to track all of these beliefs, it's an it's intersubjective limit. But the point is that in classic Dunbar, in classic, you know, Neolithic, whatever kind of tribal sort of stuff, your model accuracy grows over time as you have more and more direct interaction. Someone who's more distant from you, kind of further out, your model accuracy is not very good. And, and it, it's, you know, he drew kind of this logistic curve, whatever, maybe it's linear, doesn't really matter. The point is that the more time you spend with somebody, the better you know, and maybe the less time you spend at some point is not even worth, you know, you're still a stranger to them. But if you form clicks, if people actually cohere together. Like if that family always does stuff together, they're that annoying family that always does everything together and has happy family photos on Instagram. Um, you can model them as a click or it's like the cool kids or the goths or the whoever, you know, the, the science nerds. You could, you don't have to, you actually have much greater model accuracy if you model them as a click because you have modeled that relationship as a, almost as a compression right? To say, oh, well, they're science nerds. Of course they love Bill Nye. Of course they're going to go and watch some like rocket launch nonsense or the lunar eclipse or something, right? You can model them very accurately without having to model individuals because you've modeled their relationship to each other as a click. And so, so that he calls this model quality boosting and clicks. So if you have to model each of the 10 goths uh, individually, that's hard. But if you get to model all of them as just, well, that's the goths. They're going to go to this concert. They're going to hang out over here, right? You can do it that way. And so you can manage many, many more relationships. Okay, now take this to the Twitter scale global village. And well, I'll let you read the text here. Geographical coincidence no longer limits a set of potential relationships. And he quotes a lot of McLuhan in this, in this blog post um, where he talks about, yeah, McLuhan saw this, the global village. There is no sense of distance. All here is here. Everyone is here. And it leads to, and, and again, McLuhan called this, he said this would lead to maximal disagreement, right? This is where Zuckerberg's um, arrogance and his naivete becomes beyond the point of uh, like naivety into explicit negligent harm, is that people knew, we know if you go and give a bunch of people over here, a bunch of people over here, a lot of connection to each other, they're going to kill each other because they, they really, they don't mix. You can't mix everyone together. Um, so the idea here in the Twitter scale global village is that we can look at the relationships and the quadratic bound on relationships and actually back into a Dunbar number that's much bigger. The mutual followers and the mutual whatever could be on the scale of thousands. It's actually about our ability to model relationships. That's the limit. Anyway, really fun blog post. He says it's only, it's part one of four or something um, some great work that he's done there. So uh, definitely recommend it. Okay, so that's, that was a lot of exposition about that. Um, so uh, I will say just a few more points. Sorry for the walls of wall of text that's coming. But we already intuit that relationships are first class in the following way. Anytime you think about an institution, anything, anytime you think about an organization, 
you actually are thinking about that institution, not as the building, like the church is more than just a building with a steeple on it. The church is the relationship of people acting in a particular way. And you think about this, when there's a vacancy, right? Relationships are so first class that when we pop the biological human out of the relationship, all of those expectations and endpoints of relationships form a whole. And we call that whole an empty seat or the office, or we're trying to fill that seat. We're still looking, we have an interim chair, we're looking for a new chair to, to formally, fill, you know, to, to come in and fill that role. Anytime someone talks about roles, about positions, about the office, respect the office of the presidency, right? There's, there's, there is the, you can see it as the whole. And this really cleanly cuts into how we can analyze um, some of the tribal the dynamics and mimetic war going on around, uh, of course, right now as we're just <laughs> barreling into the election season here in America, there's a huge number of people who respect the office. They respect the flag, they respect the badge. They respect all of these aesthetics that we drape around um, the social expectation endpoints, the holes. Um, and so that is, that is a thing that, you know, it's, it's a thing. It's a real thing. Um, and to the point about, um, yeah, so even if you don't have a, what I call a Cartesian self or an atomic self, there's nobody sitting in a vacancy saying, I don't think, therefore I'm not, right? That hole is just there. It's everyone else around them thinking we need something here and it is not. And the fact that the external subjective pressure of, of, of not selves can go and ideate and create the potential for a self. That's a thing, right? That is actually the reality we live in. <laughs> so that has metaphys, I would argue that has deep metaphysical reality. Um, and in fact, is a much more useful metaphysical frame than simply viewing individuals as atoms that go and, hey, I would like to interact with you today. It's no, today, who am I defined by all these interactions coming in around me? And this gets then to what I alluded to very early on, which is celebrity and fame culture, right? If you go and you read, um, gosh, it, was, I, it wasn't uh, Taylor Swift. She's the one who thrashes around most wildly in this, but there are a lot of celebrities, I feel like, who have now written books about the crushing pressure of fame and you don't know what it's like and all this stuff. And it's real. I mean, to, to, to the, the great extent possible, I empathize with their plight because they are dealing with much more than Dunbar, right? They're dealing with like a hundred, a thousand, a 10,000 X Dunbar level of inbound social pressure on them to say, here's who you are, right? You're, 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 you're like, you're this actor from this show, right? Hey, can I take a selfie with you? It's like, no, I'm a person. I actually have a self and I have a mother who loves me who I am. And I've got brothers and sisters I joke with. And like, I got all these things. Um, I have a self that's here and no one sees you because they see the boundaries of the avatar that's been created and essentially ossified by the medium of broadcast, the medium of persistent memory of syndication, right? And there's a great story about how the, um, uh, the, the guy who, um, the actor who played the cowardly lion in the Wizard of Oz, right? The original well, 1950s, Wizard of Oz, the, the, the guy who played the Cowardly Lion, he couldn't get cast in any more roles because no one could see him without seeing a Cowardly Lion, right? And this is every time you hear an actor talking about, well, I moved out of this thing because I didn't want to get typecast as this. That is that actor saying, no, I have an independent self beyond merely the avatar that's been created around me. And this is, you know, the, the idea of celebrity and the idea of fame is something that, well, it had existed organically back in the 1800s, but it really is a production. I mean, even before that, because you would know the king or, you know, well, this is the local Duke and this is the blah, blah, blah. And there's a rumor mill. There's a very slow organic rumor mill. That is the mimetic substrate for humanity. Once we got to the electric age, again, back to McLuhan, once you get to a point where the medium conducts human uh, gossip and rumor mill and uh, socialization at light speed, you can now direct, and, and you have the fidelity of reproduction, uh, whether it's a Victorola, whether it's 5G or whatever, if you have fidelity of production, then what you can do is turn a million, a hundred million eyeballs all to one individual and lock in because of all of their social expectations of that individual. It's, they lock in the, the social pressure for that individual to manifest that avatar. And that individual breaks under that. 
right? It's the, it's the, the, the band that has a one hit wonder who goes on stage everywhere and wants to play any song except their one hit wonder, right? It's, it's all of that celebrity and fame culture. It's deeply uh, abnormal. I mean, relative to the neocortex, relative to, you know, for just hunter gatherers roaming the savannah uh, just a few hundred thousand years later, it's deeply abnormal. We're not used to dealing with a hundred million eyeballs looking at us. I mean, what the F is that? Um, so fame and celebrity culture, you can understand the crushing kind of pressure of that through this context of you're on the receiving end of expectations and the social environment that defines what you are. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. There's just a point about looking at the relationship, looking, and this gets you into that thinking about the mimetic medium as a first class thing and how that medium can ossify and reinforce. And this is when we talk about, um, you know, how, like when we look at the memes that float back and forth and the meme war um, and the tribes and whether it's QAnon or whether it's like Trump being like Teflon Trump, somehow he's able to like just skirt past everything. Um, what, what you'll notice in this is that the, the people who are masters at doing, at, at playing the mimetic field, it, they recognize that the mimetic field has certain dynamics, which is that it takes time for a meme, for a framing, for the picture of a person to uh, both ossify, to kind of, to, to, to persist. And then it takes time, and then it takes time for it to decay. If you put just enough energy into it, you can keep it persisting. And so every time Trump goes and calls somebody, oh, Sleepy Joe, or like loser, blah, 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 he's basically trying to pop a little bubble. It's like a dolphin blowing an air bubble. Like think of Trump as a dolphin. He's blowing a little air, air bubble vortex, you know, a little air bubble ring. And he's putting just enough energy into it to try to keep that ring going. And, and then the person trapped in that ring is like, but I'm not Sleepy Joe. I'm very energetic. Here's me riding a bike. It's like, you're, dude, you're not even playing the right game, right? You don't need to fight the ring. You need to fight the, 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 the susceptibility of the medium that's creating the vortices, uh, the vorticity kind of persistent. So anyway, all that being said, relationships, one more thing to think about is, the, so to that point about persistence of the vorticity um, and the social pressures and all these things, uh, what is the metabolism of a relationship? What is the metabolism uh, of it in the sense of like, how does it, how does it keep itself alive? Does, are there relationships that have um, sort of an attractor to them, attractor dynamic that sucks energy or demands energy from their participants to keep the thing alive. And if it does, and it's able to suck energy in a way that's parasitic or even detrimental to, not symbiotic, but parasitic or detrimental to the, the, the humans, the individual's ability to go into other relationships, we call that a cult, right? That is almost by definition what a cult is. That's by definition what a, um, it, it, you know, you see these manipulators. We talk about master manipulators and con men that go and completely hack the psychology of a victim. And what they do when they hack the psychology is they're creating a relationship that uh, by itself, the victim, the way they relate through that relationship, they, they kind of get sucked into it more and more. And so it's a, you can call it a vorticity or you call it, you know, whatever, an attractor. But the point is that um, at that point, you know, that's one thing that's, here's an agent. So it's a, an atomic self using a particular structure of relationship to, uh, to capture and parasitize another agent. But if that relationship starts taking on a life of its own and starts parasitizing both of them to where the manipulator becomes manipulated, and that does happen, right? Cults take a life of their own. Uh, movements and dynamics take on a life of their own. When we say this thing has taken on a life of its own, we are again, intuitively and in the vernacular, we, are, we have a tool for talking about this thing. So when those relationships have a metabolism, well, you know, what I always do is whenever I see something with metabolism, I ask, does it have agency? Does it have an agenda? What is it actually trying to do? And most of the time relationships in these senses, they, they, um, when they emerge in sort of the human interactions, um, that's, that's fine. That's just like whatever people hanging out. When, the, when they have an agenda or a mission though, they do have agency, right? They, that's what we call an institution or an organization. They make it actually the, the agenda explicit. We are here, our, our, our organizational mission is to do X, Y, Z. And if you don't want to sign up for that and you don't want to be part of that interrelationship, then don't be part of that group. But if you are, then you, you should sign up for that mission, right? And this is, so anyway, this is in the same sense, talking about something very banal and that everyone has experience with, but hopefully putting a different lens on it to how to deconstruct these things. Um, anyway. And then another question is, do relationships have rights? Um, and I already kind of, you know, 
uh, hinted that we do, at least in the legal framework, we do have concepts. Certainly, if you're, if you're an LLC or a C Corp or whatever, you absolutely have rights, right? There are corporate rights and you can sue other corporations or individuals for breach of this and that and the other. We tend to think of those as contract law, not as natural rights. But I do mean this in the sense of, do they have natural rights? Is there something, when we talk about, oh, every person is created equal, all this like Jeffersonian stuff. Jefferson didn't really talk about the relationships. You know, is there some Jeffersonian view on relationships? So when two people form a relationship, is there something that we can say there's a natural goodness there? Kind of going back to last week's thing, is there quality, is there metaphysical weight and quality in that pattern of interaction? And um, is it then therefore immoral to break it? Is there something slightly unethical or moral when we break it or, 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 or weaken it in some form, right? Some goes around um, causing children to break their relationships with their parents, causing, um, causing lovers to break the relationships with each other. We intuitively feel like something is lost when we watch a, a movie and it's like, oh, they, you know, like they didn't end up happily ever after. It, 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 they were going to and then they split at the end. And everyone would say that's, that's kind of sad. Now, we would, might go and go meta and say, well, but it was better for the individuals because they can do blah, blah, blah. But, but no one's going to deny that there's a, there's a layer of sadness there because something is lost, right? So is there something to talk about at the metaphysical, going, going back to last week, metaphysically speaking, at the social layer and the cultural layer, when relationships form there, when these standing wave patterns, um, independent of the frogs and the lily ponds, when these standing waves occur on the surface of the pond, do those waves themselves have a metaphysical weight um, to them? Is there some quality they manifest that we should talk about as a real thing? Anyway, that, that is the, the section on, on um, relationships. And there's a section here on identity as well, but I won't get that. I can just stop here and take questions. Yes, yeah, so freaking good, man. I'm just like, <laughs> like oh, okay. what's, uh, yeah, maybe we should uh, pause here to um, take some questions. There's a bunch. Uh, and I, I love this stuff because like all the 20, like thousand different me mental models just keep popping in my head, like just in relation to this. Uh -huh. um, and so the first thing that comes to mind, uh, I'll double click on the um, kind of parasocial relational aspect. It's, it's not necessarily a question to you, it's just like a question that's the edge of my thinking. Because um, McLuhan's, he started using uh, global theater instead of global village later in his career, which was related to Guy Debord's idea of the spectacle. Uh, yes. This concept of parasocial interactions where someone has a relationship with an, like an actor. Uh, and it's like someone, you know, when we put ourselves on our internet, like people are having a relationship with my avatar. Uh, yes. With me. Um, exactly. And then, like you said, um, that can be detrimental to someone's psyche if everyone starts kind of like projecting all these things. Um, but if you can go like meta a little bit, you see that it's just not one narrative, not one intersubjective narrative being uh, projected on you. It's like, you got all these different reality tunnels, mimetic tribes looking at you in a different way. Um, but if you don't have that capacity to go meta, you might miss that, that, that kind of plot line. Uh, but I wrote right here is like um, typecasted avatar. Like, you know how you get, your, your, like a, mm -hmm. you get typecasted your avatar. Is there a way you can be in the spectacle, in the global theater where you don't get typecasted? Uh, ha, great question. Um, hmm. Is there a way to be in the theater without you know, there's, there's some actors typecast. that are really good, like Johnny Depp. I don't know if Johnny Depp's a good example, but he used to be an example of this, that he didn't get typecasted because he had such a diverse uh, um, talent stack in his acting ability that he could play so much roles. But then other actors, you know, they just get typecasted in a certain way. Um, so is there a way to operate in the spectacle in the global theater um, that avoids this kind of avatar typecasting? Ah, good. Okay. Okay. So here's what I say to that. Um, is there a difference between being, well, we use typecast here in a very um, negative sense, right? That it is a binding on my ability to be my future self or to be whatever else I want to be, to define myself in some new way. Um, and if we view it from that lens to say, uh, how do we avoid being, rather than saying typecast, which is the mechanism, let's talk about the harm, right? Is there a way to prevent myself from being trapped in a past incarnation of myself? Um, because that's what we're really asking about. 
um, then, right, am I interpreting the question correctly? How do I prevent myself from being trapped? How do I retain the freedom to define my future self? So in the case of actors and whatnot, um, they know it's at that point, you almost do have to model the, the, the uh, broadcast platform as an agent and say, okay, Hollywood or the studio execs, because who's doing the typecasting? Is a studio exec coming to you saying, hey, Mr. Depp, you're worth, you know, you have a net worth of dollar sign X. Let me offer you dollar sign X over two to do this one shitty movie that's Pirates of the Caribbean 12 to be the same character again. And you're like, God damn it. Okay, I guess, right? Because that's a lot of money. But the studio exec is themselves acting as the pointy tip of the spear of a lot of social expectation that basically just prods you like a cattle prod back into the same hole you've been in for Pirates of the Caribbean 1 through 11, right? So, so you're, you're looking at this and you're like, okay, well, how do I break out of that? In that case, you have to model the studio exec. You have to model the entire juggernaut of things behind it as the oppressor, as a thing that's trying to deprive you of your creative freedom. And I'll give you a very good example of this. Um, uh, uh, Chappelle. Chappelle has a special on Netflix where he talks about why he noped out after he had a very successful show and why he left. And he does, this, uh, he does act, I, I don't remember which of the Netflix specials it is. I think it's, uh, I, I forget now, I'd have to look it up, but maybe we we'll put it in the chat later if I, if I can find it. But he talks about, he understood that he was coming under the pressure of this thing. And he in fact does it in the way that only Dave Chappelle can, which is he talks about it as uh, he relates a story from uh, the autobiography of a pimp talking about how much mileage you can put on a hoe before she breaks. And he felt he was the hoe and Hollywood is putting him, putting mileage on him. Uh, and he basically noped out before he ran out of mileage. So it's, I'm sorry to turn it really dark and kind of like gruesome, but, but that's, that is him as, a, as an individual saying, I am more than just the boundaries Hollywood wants to put on me or the studio execs or whatever. I'm going to do this other thing. How you escape that freedom, or sorry, how you escape those shackles in those cases, um, some people do it by going to Broadway, right? You see this all the time. Like, uh, what's your mother, Daniel uh, Radcliffe, right? He's like, I'm tired of being Harry Potter. I'm not a child anymore. I'm not a wizard. Uh, I'm not even a muggle. I'm not Harry Potter. I'm going to go do some Broadway for a while, <laughs> right? So he changes to a different medium. Broadway does not have the amplification dynamics of Hollywood, right? Um, Chappelle was doing, on all, you see this in comics a lot because they don't have a ready-made formula. They're making themselves all the time. Their job essentially is to transgress uncomfortably, right? That's the best comics. They always, they point to truths through transgression. Carlin does this, Chappelle does this. Um, so in any case, Comics, then once they go from the downstairs, like back at the whatever comedy catch, and they go onto Netflix, or they go onto like some big HBO special or Comedy Central, boom, they blow up. And that's when social pressure comes back in. So, so I think, you know, I, I don't have a cute answer for that, how you avoid the typecasting, but I think it is important to realize that those chains come from the application medium itself. They're a result of the medium dynamics. It's like, you know, uh, a, a point I made in one of my blog posts was that water and ice, fundamentally different things, except it's the same molecule, but at different densities, right? And you can take a hammer and smack the side of, like smack it into a pond, nothing happens. So some fish kind of scatter away. If you have a big block of ice, you hit one side of it with a hammer, the other side can hear the hammer, right? And our mimetic medium now, our communications medium are, are, are various things. They are now, we're all trapped in ice. Uh, you know, it's much more ringing. There's a lot more ringing going on. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that quite answers that question. I will, I'll post a couple more slides here that from my other, did it work? Oh, come on. Oh, because I'm in Zoom. I'm not actually in Keynote. Nope, I'm, okay, back in Keynote. Where's Keynote? Here's Keynote, my other window. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm going to paste some relevant slides here. This is from my, um, can you guys see this? This is from my presentation I did at the, uh, the uh, Decentralized Web uh, Camp uh, last uh, July in 2019. And this directly ties to digital privacy. Um, I've been asking about why do we want digital privacy since 1993? It always comes down to hiding stuff or like whatever, the government, screw the government, they can't, 
you don't know me. Um, and I articulate differently. Privacy gives us the space to define our future selves, right? Free of institutional and governmental and social pressures, it gives us free reign to be whoever we want to be. It's not a hiding place, it is a womb. And back to this picture, you can see what my picture here. Privacy gives us the ability to have agency within this realm. And because we all live online now, digital privacy is so important because I have the right to be myself. I should have the right. It's an, it's an extension of Jeffersonian natural law for individual agents. I should have the right to create myself and to have different kinds of relationships. So when you view the, the right, the, 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 discussion about, oh, free speech versus anonymity online and do the platforms have a blah, 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 and all this other nonsense. They, they miss sometimes the fact that the anonymity is not about Russian troll bots showing up to blow up democracy. The anonymity is to allow people to explore and be themselves. And in an earlier era, before eternal September, like in 1992, when people were online, even the very online people, it wasn't dense enough and they could find niches that the, the, it wasn't hot enough in a McLuhan sense that people could be anonymous and establish norms, build values, you know, using these different ways. Every Usenet group had these dynamics going on and they were able to create shared values within those spaces. This kind of touches on that every conversation is a space thing, but don't have time to get into that. But anyway, this is my point there that digital privacy and privacy in general as a concept should not be about hiding your weed, hiding your porn, hiding all your weird stuff you don't want the government to know. It should be about letting us develop our identity, letting us develop peer wise trust and um, letting us build new inner subjective um, things. It's, it's really about freedom. And, and this is, I've not heard it articulate like this. I'm also not a super deep expert on this stuff. This is just kind of what I came to um, as I was thinking about decentralized web and why privacy is so important. Sorry for the aside uh, there, but yeah. No, no, that's, that's really good stuff, man. Um, we're at the hour. Are you cool what? to stay 15 more minutes? Or do you oh yeah, to... absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, so if you have any questions, start putting them. If you have any questions uh, that I missed because I wasn't really following the chat, just maybe paste them uh, in the chat box again and then plus one them as well. That would help me out. I have another question. Um, so, you know, you know, stoicism, uh, their, their axiomatic principle is, is live in accordance with nature. But I kind of like using Jordan Hall's uh, kind of not, he doesn't talk about stoicism, but I want to repurpose this for like a metamodern stoicism is mm -hmm. being in, in the right relationship with reality. Um, and right. if you're in the right relationship with reality and the right relationship with everything, right? All these kind of these, these institutions, these other people, other relationships, uh, these narratives that exist, and then kind of the, all the subpersonalities uh, that, that exist within. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like how you described it, the, that, that kind of a frame switch of having relationality first. Mm -hmm. um, it's not only descriptively rich, uh, but it seems to be uh, more ethical. To, if, if we're going to go with the right relationship with reality mm -hmm. uh, a model that Jordan Hall was running with. So I was wondering if you can kind of speak on the, the ethical, ethical aspect of, of, of this. Yeah. Um, this touches on some other mental models too, which this is just the beauty of it. It all kind of connects. So Jordan is, you know, he's not wrong, but then it's the question is like, so what are you really saying, Jordan? You're right. I love, I love Jordan, right. To be very clear. <laughs> I have no issue with Jordan. I love it. Um, um, but when we talk about, you being in right relationship with reality, that already does this thing. Um, did I talk about interpolation? Was I going to talk? Yeah, so let's talk about interpolation. It's a term from some Marxist scholarship, but interpol, uh, you know, maybe I should, uh, for those who are not familiar, I should just go ahead and bring up the, um, um, interpolation share. Uh, oh, Yarko's here. Cool. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> interpolation, this idea that, um, now this is based, there's a lot of like, okay, pretty heavy Marxist stuff going on in here, but, um, ultimately the idea is that, um, people are defined, our identities, our identities are subject to relationship pressure. To be, you know, completely honest, like some of this stuff is 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 very much similar to kind of what I was talking about, right? Like, um, and what their what the Marxist critique was was that the apparatus of the state or the apparatus of like the capitalist economic production sort of uh, mentality created inside people the subjective experience of I am just a laborer, I am a worker, I need work, I need a job, right? I'm a consumer, I must consume, 
I am an, I am a voter. I must go vote. And it's like, no, you're a human being and you get to be whatever the F you want to be. If you decide that voting isn't for you anymore, you need to go find other human beings that don't want to vote and you go do your own thing, right? But interpolation is this idea that it's, it's, it's where, um, okay, back to, back to my slide. Uh, sorry for bouncing back and forth on the share so much, but um, interpolation is what happens right here at the output port of that relationship. Interpolation is the relationship, maybe the sum integral of all the relationships of the institutions around you telling you what you must be. So uh, when to your question about Jordan and being in right relationship, that still unfortunately holds uh, it creates, it's an othering. It creates like a me, I'm a me, and I need to be in right relationship with an other. As opposed to asking, what is the me that is needed to show up in this relationship? So sort of that sense of like ideas have people, relationships have people. And if we view ourselves as being um, the union Venn diagram of all of the needs and all of the, 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 both the gives and the takes of all these relationships that we're in, then we can stop viewing ourselves as simply a, a little ball being bounced around. How do I be in resonance with this thing that's like jostling me, all this big nasty reality out there? It's more about, it's sort of stepping into a, a uh, I don't know if this, there's a Keegan level or whatever else, but it's like stepping a different frame of mind that says, what are all these things trying? What do they want me to be? And what is, what is it that I want to be? And you can actually have that question about how to hold these different circles um, together, um, to use the, 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 the stage analogy, right? That all these different spotlights and they're not all the limelights are not converging. Where, where do you want to be? What is the you? How do you spread yourself out like a blob to cover all those limelights? So that's what I say when you say right relationship, again, I don't disagree with Jordan, but I would, I would delve into it that way to say, let's not already interpolate ourselves as being other from reality, but rather see ourselves as co-creating these relationship fields because when we're a blob, we're not just a blob spread out trying to cover all these limelights being in tension and stress. We're a highly reflective blob that then reflects light onto other people. We are the limelights putting pressure on them. I'm demanding my employees to show up in a certain way. I'm demanding my kids and my wife to show up in certain ways, right? We are, so, so that's the inter-reflection and we are all, we're, we're all in the middle of this, this thing. Anyway, sorry, that, I don't know if that answered the question, but that, that was my, yeah, you know, want to talk to it. That was awesome. Um, so we'll, uh, I'm going to pick a few people and then, uh, uh, we'll close out as soon. Um, Kyle, you had uh, some comments on game B uh, and trust, uh, if you can unmute yourself and, and share it with the group. Sure. Thanks, Peter. This has been great. Um, thank you. I, 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 way back in probably 20 minutes into your talk, I, I threw out a couple of ideas and basically just, the thinking is that game B then is basically the reinstitutionalization of trust. Um, because the game theory of game A is the deterioration of trust and why it's self terminating. Right. And so mm -hmm. how, how do you, is, is there anything you can talk about with regard to restructuring institutions to create that environment of trust to change the game theory? Right, and I know that that's part of the part of the story that you might be doing next week. But it, can you can you give a little riff on that? Yeah, um, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I would say is that uh, da, 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 let me see here if I can just find this one part here on the core of game B. <clears throat> Sorry, this is just just one one second here. Um, I think my, my, um, my, my, my reasoning is this. Trust is, um, let's see, where's my slide here? Let's go back to here. Where I said trust is the fundamental, is it this slide, something like this? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, if, if game A's trust environment is deteriorating pretty quickly, as we're seeing with all the social and tech, political and technological forces that are pushing on it, how, how do, does it have to break further in order to reestablish trust? Or, and how do you reshape the institutions? Yeah. Okay. Back to that. Is, Got it. Yeah. 
Okay. okay. So here's what I would say. Um, I, I finally some stuff connected in my head. It just took a second. Sorry. Not enough coffee. I've been trying to have coffee and, uh, I and hear beef you. jerky, but I hear you. All good. Beef jerky uh, absorbs some of the coffee and, you know, reduces the coffee absorption rate in my bloodstream. Um, so game A, as we talk about it, you know, if you talk to Jordan uh, or maybe Daniel Schmachtenberger or whatnot, they'll talk about it as being rivalrous dynamics uh, and rivalry, things like that. Um, I might talk more about Moloch, uh, you know, Ginsburg and, and Slate Star Codex style. Um, and and that, so that's my bent on it, which is that we have created institutions that um, – uh, I mean, they don't even talk about trust, right? They atomize individuals. The whole facility of like the post-war era now has been creating institutional, political, economic systems, mimetic systems. We, we ignore the mimetic sometimes we talk about this, but all of these different infrastructures of modernity atomize the individual. They devalue trust. They almost throw trust aside. I mean, and the crypto, you know, the crypto anarchists are the worst. They're like, oh, totally trustless proof of work, blah, 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 right? It's like, no, we want actually maximal trust. We want trust preserving. Trust is the scarce thing. We want to create infrastructures that promote interhuman value creation and trust building. Um, and all of the structures, when you view it, and maybe, maybe I should just, yeah, maybe next time should be about this a little bit. But, but as a preview, all of these infrastructures, they create a way for people to interact without trust. What is currency at the end of the day? If you go and read Sapiens or read like, you know, history of money or whatever else, the Ferguson and some others, like the money as a currency allows us to interact without relating. They're interactions without relationship. All right. I have a relationship to the dollar bill. I have some hopefully uh, good faith belief in the solvency of the United States Federal Reserve. And I'll take a dollar bill for a random, random stranger on the street or I'll give them a dollar bill for a, a thing. Currency, calorie shells, whatever you have it, currency as a way of uh, providing liquidity for trade allows um, a, a Muslim here and a Christian here and a Buddhist over there 2,000 miles away to interact with each other without knowing, without trusting, without sharing anything with each other. So as a scale-out mechanism, it is completely and massively powerful for that first stage of globalization. But now that we're globally connected by trade, now that we're globally connected on trustless interaction, the question is how do we create a global system or create, yeah, create a facility that allows everyone to coexist on the earth uh, without their mimetic tribes being smushed into each other headlong to conflict. On 9-11, I mean, there's a somber date to be talking about this, right? The intersection of cultures, and, and to be very clear, I'm a you know, full-blooded American through and through, 9-11 is a tragedy, but if you go and you read what it is that the fundamentalist Wahhabists, which are funded by the Saudis, of course, but if you read what the Al-Qaeda philosophic and sort of political complaints are against the encroachment of Western culture and values into their world, the complaint there doesn't, I mean, again, like just like if you go and read the Unabomber, you don't have to agree with what they did, but it is interesting, you know, holding a conflicted mind and reading what is they're complaining about and maybe taking a little bit of face value. And what they're complaining about is the, basically the entire rest of the world having lost the mimetic war to America because Hollywood, right, is one of our biggest exports. It's still our biggest export. Uh, to some extent, our most powerful mimetic export. So game B, back to your question, actually, game B is how do we move beyond these mechanisms that erode trust, atomize individuals, get individuals interacting with each other within rigid frameworks, within tyrannies of some sort, whether it's a tyranny of trustless interaction, which is the, the uh, almighty petrodollar, almighty all fungible petrodollar, um, or if it's institutions of hierarchy to say hierarchical control and you know, you report to your boss, your boss reports to their boss, and eventually all the way up the chain, you know, someone treats you as a replaceable cog that's, you know, whinging about something and they'll go take care of the, the grease, the, the squeaky wheel, right? There's all of these structures of game A are about, um, you know, dollars and fungible units of value, quote unquote value, uh, for everything in the world, and then hierarchical scaling uh, and command and control for all the rest for the remainder, right? For the, for the residue that falls out of that. And in fact, when we talk about financialization destroying the world, it's this, well, kind of interpolation of a, of a sort. It's the reduction of everything in the world to what can be quantified into fungible units, right? Even when I was a kid, I thought about it as like, I was like, you know, I read about millionaires and billionaires. It's so interesting because the billions and billions of dollars they hoard and the hundreds of millions they spend on their art, you can count that in terms of burger flipping hours of the person flipping burgers at McDonald's, right? Because it's fungible to labor. 
but it's not fungible because the Mona Lisa sitting in a dusty attic somewhere is not the same as somebody actually making food for someone else to eat that they need to live. But we live in a world that's required this fungibility lens to be impact, impact on everything. So anyway, the game B approach is to say, can we solve for sufficiency from the ground up? Sufficiency, both in terms of sustainable energy and all of your physical needs, you know, all the way up the Maslow hierarchy, but then getting to play where we can create the sustainable architectures and infrastructure so people can build real relationships with each other. It's, it's about emerging conviviality um, bubbles and cells everywhere um, within the cultures and the tribes and the belief systems and all these intersubjectivities. Anyway, long-winded answer, but hopefully that paints a picture. Let's uh, um, end on one more question. Um, SG, you had a question about multiple selves and subpersonalities and whatnot. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks. Hey, Peter. Um, Hi. Lots of great content. I feel like I'll have to listen to the YouTube video a couple of times before I fully digest it. But one question that I've been um, toying with recently is I found myself um, realizing that identity is more so something applied to me than something that uh, I necessarily control. And one particular thing that would be useful is the ability for myself to manage different identities for different uses and really treat identity as a tool uh, rather than uh, a part of, of the self. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for how to go about managing that without losing my head because it's not something that we've necessarily evolved to do. Um, yes, you're right. It is really a difficult thing to manage that. And if you mean manage it from, do you mean from like a, a psychosocial, like psycho emotional perspective, or do you mean it from like a technology perspective or, or all of the above? I think, yeah, all of the above. If you can talk okay. about it. Um, I think, you know, you might find this interesting. This is a, you know, kind of a, a appendix slides I didn't get to, but uh, Kalia, identity, she calls herself Identity Woman. So it's identitywoman.net. Um, but she has um, a really great presentation that I have in the link here. Um, if you can look at it, you can Google for it. It's the Domains of Identity. Um, and she talks about identity context. And um, if you look at technology-wise, this is much more about distributed and decentralized identity systems and all this other stuff. But, um, but there's many different... I think you mean it more from the social context, right? Uh, sort of like, how do I show up in these different places? Um, and I think well, one of, the, or no, do you not mean that? Yeah, I think so. I, I do think that they're quite similar. Like I do think it reduces down to decentralized identity, but uh, I, maybe I, my framing is more on the social side. Yeah, well, the decentralization of identity, to be clear, my interest in it is about removing power from the structures that lock things in, not about keeping it always uh, de-atomized, uh, de right? I think people, it's fine to have your identity stored in some place if that place is not uh, like Orwellian, like you must be this, right? So um, to your point about that freedom and how do we break free of, or how do we fight for our agency against this back pressure, right? How do we provide back pressure to these things a little bit? Um, I think actually to start with, seeing the world in this way and trying to put your, uh, build a model of the relationships, um, build a model of the relationships and, and hold those in your head and use those to think about all the messages coming through them. So, um, and, and to the point of like the stoic practice, when you do reflect on this, um, you know, in your daily practice, think about what are the things that upset me? What are the things that got to me? Maybe not upset. What are the things that pleased me, right? Because positive reinforcement and dopamine is a really powerful way to manipulate people too. But you think about what are the strong signals that came into me today through what relationships they come in and, and stop thinking about it as being the other person doing it unto me. Maybe they're trying to build the relationship in a way so that the relationship itself does this to me or holds me in this way. And I can push back on my end of the relationship and change it, right? It's like both of you kind of pushing this board and there's a marble bouncing in the middle. And so think about it in that context. So don't see just your identity and then the pressures you feel. That's also kind of an interpolation of a sort because it, it casts you as a receiver only. You do have agency in this. Um, but the way you can manifest that agency, you have to first be very perceptive. You have to think deeply uh, and, and perceive broadly what is your emotional state in response to how that relationship is changing you? 
And also, do you, do you think about the relationship as different than the other person, the person or the things, the persons on the other side of that relationship? Um, this ties also somewhat to the Gervais theory, uh, to, to uh, Venkat Rao's Gervais theory of institutions and organizations. Um, people who can model these relationships within institutions explicitly will end up being able to make it to the leadership tier. Those who cannot will not. And so anyway, that's my, my feedback to you on that. Great. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll end here. Uh, that was a, a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the session. Great, thank um, you. Any, any uh, closing, I'll stop sharing your screen. Any closing okay. words? Um, not, not particularly, just thank you for, for the, you know, inviting me and having me here. Thanks everyone for sharing your time. Bruce, I, it's good to see Bruce here. Yeah, Bruce, I would love to, uh, to get your thoughts on, um, uh, you know, what, what you think about this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, just, I, I, I can't actually see all the participants as I'm talking here, but um, thank you everyone for, for joining and, um, and just sharing part of your morning with me. And I'll uh, also make some announcements, uh, closing announcements in a moment, but Peter, thanks so much again for being a sense maker in residence. Um, thank you. This is uh, quickly becoming one of my favorite uh, series of this <laughs> week. Um, so upcoming sessions uh, relatedly to what we talked about today, we have a uh, collective presencing um, in about 40 minutes. Uh, with Rhea back, and this is like an intersubjective uh, meditative practice where we kind of like get a sense of the contours of relationality and the real felt sense level. So that's going to be at the STOA coming up soon if you want to check that out. Um, good contrast. And then tonight we have Socratic Social uh, with the STOA Village. Uh, Raven Connolly is going to host this one. Uh, it used to be called Socratic Speed Dating, but it was never really about dating. <laughs> so it's, uh, it was a little confusing, but it it's basically has a speed dating format where you go in different rooms with people, just get social, get to know each other. It's really, really fun. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Get some sociality with the, the whole Stoa family and village. Uh, and if you'd like more events, you can check out the website. And if you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so here. That being said, thank you again, Peter. Oh, uh, yeah. One, one thing, um, if you could send me the chat log, I'd be happy to, to go and try to, you know, answer these things in the Discord chat uh, to people. Sure. Um, you, you can, I'll send it to you, but you can save it. Eh? I think you can. Oh, I can. You just oh. click the, the dots and go save chat. All right. Save access. chat. Chat saved. Nice. Show and finder. Look at that. It just works. Cool. Uh, cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you in Discord and next Bye, week. Everyone. All right. Bye-bye.